Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 13, beginning of verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. Wake up. Amen. And if you're a snoozer and you hit the snooze button, say it again to somebody else. Uh, how many hit the snooze more than one or two times? In a, I'm guilty. If I, can, if I can help but just ask my wife, I'll hit the snooze button. Well, anyways. It is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us, therefore, cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Not in rioting and drunkenness. Not in chambering and wantonness. Not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. For a few moments tonight, on this Tuesday night, we're going to teach on the subject, Battle Ready. Battle Ready. Let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you for your people that are here tonight, God, the faithful saints of the Most High. Bless them, God. Anoint our ears to hear and my mouth to speak your words, God. And have your way in this service, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, in Jesus' name. One more time to your neighbor and say, ask them, are you battle ready? Are you battle ready? Amen. You may be seated. How many know this song? Sing it with me. I'm in the Lord's army. I'm in the Lord's army. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly o'er the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. You all went to Sunday school. Praise God. Look at your neighbor again one more time. I'll try not to do this again. Just say, are you in the Lord's army? If you're not in the Lord's army, you can be before you leave the house of God tonight. All you have to do is repent of your sins, turn your life over to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And everybody in the New Testament, when they received the gift of the Holy Ghost, it was accompanied by this sign. They spoke with tongues as God's Spirit gave them the utterance. That's just getting enlisted, but there's a difference between being enlisted in the Lord's army and being battle ready. There's a difference between being a new babe in Christ and then also being mature. Some people desire the sincere milk of the word, but they never get past the milk, and they have never learned to take the sustenance of the meat of the word of God, and the meat is where they gain strength. And you gain this power to overcome by being spiritually mature. In our text tonight, we're knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. There are people today that are sleeping. People in church pews are sleeping. They're not aware. They're not paying attention to the signs of the time. And the signs of the time are everywhere. If there was ever a time in which the church needed to awake out of sleep and get ready for what the Lord is about to bring upon this earth and get ready for that great and glorious day when the trump of God sounds, the dead in Christ rise and those who are alive and remain are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. If that was ever a time for us to be battle ready, not just rapture ready, but battle ready, it's right now. Because we are facing an enemy. And we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, the Bible said, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So in response to that, Paul is here saying that we need to understand that the night is far spent. Uh, it's almost here. The time has almost arrived. The day is at hand, so we need to cast off the works of darkness. Uh, whatever things in your life that are holding you back, that causing darkness 
in your life. Or like when you get out of bed, how many of you just throw off your covers in the morning before you get up and get going? I do it with a very vengeful effect. I don't want to get out of bed. Throw them things off because I've got to get up now. So cast off the works of darkness, he's saying, and put on the armor of light. There is armor for us to be robed in or prepared in if we're going to be battle ready. To be battle ready means that you're sufficiently equipped and that you have been trained and that you have a numerical advantage over the enemy. Now, I don't know about you, but whether there's two or three are gathered together in the name of the Lord, the Bible says there he is in the midst of them. We can have a numerical advantage just as long as there are two of us present. But here we have the night, about 75 people probably, and we have a great advantage over the enemy. Numerically, we have this great advantage. And if we have been equipped and battle ready, there is no weapon that's formed against you that's going to prosper. But to do that, you have to put on the armor of light. Then he says, let us walk honestly, as in the day. Not in rioting and drunkenness. Let's, let's, let's not get caught up with all these other things in life and, and all the stuff that doesn't matter. Not in chambering and wantonness. Not in strife and envying. All these things are, he's talking to the church here, you understand. These are things he's telling the church of the living God. Don't get caught up in all that stuff. Don't get caught up in strife among yourselves. Don't get caught up in envying among yourselves because you need to be battle ready for the day ahead. And then he says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Here he is making the comparison. He's saying the armor of light and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is the same thing. Because when you put on the armor of light, you're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. You are then also lights, the Bible says. And you use not to hide that light under some kind of bushel. You're not supposed to put it out or extinguish it. Instead, you're supposed to make yourself ready and be battle ready for the fight ahead. So put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the armor of light and don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You want to know how to overcome temptation? Don't put yourself in a situation where you provide for your flesh what it desires that you know it shouldn't have. I like me a big old piece of rhubarb pie. And if I'm at the right place and I make provision for my flesh to fulfill the lust thereof, I'm going to buy me a piece of, I might buy the whole pie. Because you don't find much rhubarb pie out there. If I go out to eat tonight to Applebee's, I'm going to be strongly tempted to buy a blondie before I leave that place. And my wife will say, now we're on a diet. And she's right. She's on a diet. Praise God. But you have to not put yourself in situations where you fulfill the lust of the flesh, the desires, the things that you know that drag you down. There is nothing more disheartening to have someone put on the armor of light who isn't ready to wear the armor. David, if you remember, was facing the Philistine named Goliath. And what did Saul offer him? He offered him his armor. And he could not wear it. He was just a youth. He wasn't skilled yet in the fine art of being a warrior. So instead, he had to go out there and battle with just his shepherd's clothing, his staff, and his sling, and fight an enemy. But the Lord had already prepared him and made him battle ready by giving him confidence in the fact that he had killed a lion and a bear. So this Philistine, this he called him an uncircumcised Philistine, was no match for the God that David had with him. I want you to know tonight, no matter what situation you're going through, no matter what the calamity is, the problem, if you've got Jesus on your side, and you've got a past that tells you, you know what, he did it for me back then, he's going to do it for me today, and he'll continue to do it in the future. In fact, that's what Romans said, that these things that happen, they work faith these tribulations and these trials. And so the Bible is very clear then that we need to be ready for battle. Battle ready, fully and sufficiently equipped and trained for the fight 
ahead of us. How many are love and are experiencing the joy of coming to services on Sunday and, and watching how God is moving among His people and people being baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost? This is because we are in a position right now of growth and revival. God is growing the church and God is reviving the church at the same time. This means that we have to be ready for the battle ahead, to go out there and grab and snatch people out of the enemy's hand because they don't belong to the enemy. Nobody that ever uh, was born belongs to the devil. Do you think God wants any human being to go to hell? He does not. He didn't design hell for humanity. He designed hell for the devil. And so we have a job to do. That is to go out into the highways and the byways and compel people to come in. So we look tonight at Ephesians chapter 6. The whole armor of God. We're supposed to put on the whole armor of God. Put on, he said. He said, let us will let us put on the armor of light. And so, chapter 6, verses 13 to 17, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith he shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. These are what we call the armor of God. It's what the writer said was the armor of God. So when Paul is talking about in Romans, put on the armor of light, when he's talking about put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what he's talking about. It's the armor of of God, when you put these things on, every one of these things is a type of Christ and what, type, what Christ can do for you. But when you walk in this armor, it makes you so that you can fight an enemy and be sufficiently equipped, trained, and protected to do the job ahead of you. How many are thankful that God is able to keep you? Amen? God's able to keep you from falling. He's able to keep you in the day of battle so you remain strengthened and strong in Him. And so that first element, that first first piece of armor is the helmet of salvation. It says in the book of Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. You need to put on the helmet of salvation. You need to ask God, Lord, protect my mind and protect my eyes. And put that helmet on so you can make sure you're looking straight ahead. Protect my eyes from seeing things they shouldn't see. Protect my ears from hearing things they shouldn't hear. Amen? These are the areas that are not just physical things, but they're symbols for things. There is a spiritual hearing. If you have on the helmet of salvation, your mind won't be corrupted by hearing what the devil and what this world has to offer. Instead, you're going to hear the pure, clear things of God. When you have on the helmet of salvation, your, your, your eyesight should be focused on what God has ahead of you. This is the helmet of salvation. It protects your head. It protects your mind. It protects your thinking. And so we keep our eyes focused and our mind focused. And we, we, we don't allow thoughts to come into our mind that would somehow cause unbelief and doubt and fear. Instead, when those things come our way, we have the helmet of salvation. Let me tell you tonight that the enemy wants you to be filled with fear. He wants to speak things into your mind that you begin to think, I can take care of this in my own understanding and in my own thoughts. Okay, but you cannot do that in a spiritual battle. You have to trust in the living God to carry you through the battle that's ahead of you. When you're Mind is Holy Spirit governed. There is no weapon that can come against you that will cause you to doubt and fear God. He said in Romans 8, 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When you have the helmet of salvation on, it protects your mind and you have peace of mind. God has not given you tonight the spirit of fear, but of power. Love and a sound mind. But if you keep your helmet off in the day of battle, 
when you're fighting an enemy that does not care about you one bit. He wants to destroy you. When you're doing that, understand, friend, that that helmet will protect your mind and give you a sound mind. Also, Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I want the mind of Christ. I don't want my own mind, my own will, because I've often found out that when I go by my own thinking, there's always some danger in that. Instead, I go to God and said, God, would you help me through this situation? While I'm at it, let me tell you, when you're praying in the Holy Ghost, some people pray in the Holy Ghost up to a certain point and they stop because they don't allow the Holy Ghost to change their will, to change their mind. But when you're praying, say, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? And the Holy Ghost will show you what to do. He will lead you in what to do. He will impress you in what to do. And so allow the Holy Ghost, my will, not my will, Jesus, but thy will be done. And what that takes is me allowing my mind, my thinking to step to the side and allow the Holy Ghost to operate in me and through me. And so it's protecting you. So every day you need to pray, Lord, help me to put on the helmet of salvation today and protect my mind. And in this world that we're living in today, there's all kinds of wickedness that can destroy your mind. You, you don't have to spend much time on any social media website to find something that's going to trick on your mind and put words in your mind that you don't think of any other time. And it's too late by the time it pops on to turn it off because it's already been said and done. And there you are. You've allowed your mind to focus on that thing. And you may not think about it, but someday when you're upset and you're angry, a word's going to come out of your mouth that you don't normally say. But it's because somewhere along the way you allowed your mind to let that thing come in there. It sowed a seed that eventually manifested itself. And so you need to protect your mind. Look at somebody and say, protect your mind. Protect your mind. That's why I don't watch horror movies. Amen. I don't like them. I've got to protect my mind. So be careful. Be careful to protect your mind. Be careful to protect what you're focused on. This, this gospel it is a reasonable gospel. We're supposed to be able to give a reason to people for the hope that lies within us. Uh, one of the best ways to make sure your mind is protected is to read the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Put the Word of God in. You're not just putting it in your heart, but it's filtering through your mind and speaking to you and giving you strength to be battle ready. Also, it's the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, Psalms 23, verse 3, He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. The Lord wants to keep you and keep your emotions and your heart right. It says in Hosea 10 and 12, Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till He come and rain righteousness upon you. If, if your heart's not right, if, if you know that you have a bad attitude about something and you see somebody in that, you ever get that feeling in your heart when you see somebody and you know it's not a right feeling in your heart, that means you need to find a place of prayer and you say, Lord, my heart's not right. Would you please, please, please repair this, breast, this breastplate of righteousness in my life? Years ago, I was at a meeting, prayer and fasting conference, and uh, the Lord gave me a vision. Me and my friend Leon were there, and uh, we had on what looked like silver armor, a silver breastplate. It was all dinged up and beat up and uh, had been repaired over and over again. And um, well, ours had holes in it, and it was damaged. And uh, I prayed and sought the Lord, what was this meaning? And then the next part of the vision Leon and I both were covered in brand new golden armor. And it was beautiful, pristine. There was nothing wrong with it. But my brother was in the same vision. My brother hadn't gone to that prayer and fasting conference, and he had on the silver armor like we did, but he didn't get the gold armor and because uh, he wasn't there for that meeting, I guess. But he didn't have the gold armor. You need to find a, a place to pray and allow God to either uh, go come in and and 
and uh, cleanse your heart. Go in, come in and repair the damage done to your heart and allow Him to work a miracle in your life in that way. Because if you don't, you're going to find yourself in the day of battle losing heart and having fear or being cowardly and running away in the day of battle. So Hosea says to go ahead and sow in righteousness, reap in mercy. And then he says, break up your fallow ground. You have to break up your fallow ground. You have to be willing to sit down or kneel down before the Lord and just pour all out. Now you might do it in your private time, but somewhere along the way you need to make sure your heart is right and ask God to filter everything that comes into or out of your heart. Amen? To filter it. There's nobody righteous but God. But we stand in His righteousness. We call it the, breast, the breastplate of righteousness. Another scripture talks about that we are putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked about that earlier in the book of Romans. Another place talks about how that we are putting on the robe of righteousness where God doesn't see my sin, my weakness, my unrighteousness. Instead, He sees the robe that I have on. It's the robe of His righteousness. How do I obtain that righteousness? It's when I'm baptized in the name of Jesus Christ initially, but also in a continued life of prayer where I say, God, continue, please, to protect my righteousness. Your heart is so wicked sometimes. The Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked, and who can know it? it you, you don't trust your heart. Your heart will mislead you if it's not led by the Spirit of God. Instead, you need to ask God, Lord, protect me and help me to wear this breastplate of righteousness so that my heart doesn't become damaged by the enemy. He's going to throw a weapon at you, a spear, an arrow of some kind, and it might get through everything and pierce that breastplate, but it will more than likely bounce off if your breastplate is protected taken care of, polished, and repaired. How do I repair it? I pray. I find a place of prayer. I say, Jesus, please protect me. And I take on that robe or that breastplate of righteousness. Ezekiel 28, verse 30, And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart. And he goeth in before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. You need to put on in your mind the breastplate and let God impress you about things in the Spirit, uh, impress you about what's going on around you. The Bible says to try the spirits and see whether they are of God. How do you do that? You do that by allowing the Lord, through the power of the Holy Ghost, to impress your mind about things that are going on. You might be in a relationship that is causing you harm, but you don't realize it yet because you're not sensitive in the spirit because your breastplate, your, your, your heart has been damaged. Your heart has been affected by that relationship. So then you pray, Jesus, please help me. Show me what is going on here. And then he reveals maybe you're spending or accompanying too much time with someone who is damaging that part of your life. I don't know where that came from, but listen to me. Be careful about who you spend time with. Make sure there are people that are going to build you up and not tear you down. You only have one life. Don't waste it. Jesus is coming. He said it's time to wake out of sleep. It's time to get up off the bed. It's time to get equipped. You've been trained. You've been equipped. We have numerically sufficient numbers to fight an enemy. If this church and every other church that's spirit-filled in this area, the Ohio Valley area, ever got a true understanding of who we are in Christ, in Huntington, the problems that are in Huntington today would not exist because we would be able to do what they did in Rome and where they, or what they did in the New Testament in Jerusalem and throughout Samaria and Judea and the uttermost parts of the earth. This thing wasn't done in a quarter and it wasn't hidden away, but these men of God, they were... Dressed, these women of God, they were ready. They were in their armor. They were battle ready for the fight that was before them. And they turned the world upside down with the doctrine and the gospel. I want to turn the city of Huntington upside down. Because when we do that, it's not really upside down, it's right side up, you see. 
So the next thing we do is we're going to have our loins go about with truth. You have to love the truth. I know people that know the truth, but they don't love the truth. The, the girdle was used to keep the rest of the garments from hampering your progress. It could be used to carry your sword and your money. Uh, you want God to wrap himself around you, his truth. Let it keep you from lies and error. The best way to know whether a person's telling the truth, a lie or not, is to read your Bible again and to pray. It's all a part of taking care of this armor. It's not just enough to put it on, but you've got to maintain it through a relationship with Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. It says that God sent them a strong delusion because they did not love the truth. you got to learn to love the truth. The Bible said buy the truth and sell it not. Don't let it go. I am a firm believer in the message that we preach, the message of salvation, because it's the message that the apostles preached, and it's the message that Jesus taught them to preach, which is Acts 2.38, the new birth. You have to be born again of water and of spirit to enter, to even enter into the kingdom of God. And then we're going to leave holy and godly lies. I, I love the truth of his word. I love the truth of the message of the one God. There is one God. Amen. One Lord. He said, I even I am the Lord. And beside me there is no Savior. It's only Him. One God. And Father of all. Who is above all. And in all. And through you all. We serve Him. That's a truth that we know. It's not a truth. I'm sorry. It is the truth. Jesus Christ didn't say, I am a truth. If he said, I am a truth, that means there would be several different truths that we could use to find salvation. That's not what he said. He said, I am the truth and the life. That's what he said. And so that's what we have to do. We have to learn to love the truth. And if you love the truth, that means you love Jesus. And when you don't love the truth, when you are so easily persuaded not to follow the truth, that means that your love for Jesus is somehow lacking. And so you need to have your loins girt about with truth. John said in 1 John 3.18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, put your mouth, or put your actions where your mouth is. I was going to say put your money where your mouth is, but put your actions where your mouth is. If you say you love God, and if you say you love people, let your actions show that. It's not enough just to get up and pontificate about how much you love people when you mistreat them six days of the week and on Sunday you're nice to people. This is a seven day a week salvation. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Now are people easy to love? Not always. I'm not easy to love. I'm telling you, I can be a grumpy old man sometimes. Wednesday night comes around, it's family night. Every once in a while, I get grumpy with the grandkids. And I hate being that way, but it happens. And uh, my wife, thank God, she loves me. Now, she let me know about it, but she loves me. And I'm glad she lets me know about it because it reminds me, listen, what I have is special. I've got a family. I've got children. I've got grandchildren. That's the blessings of God. So I have to trust in that. And so he's saying, if you really love people, if you really say you love something, then put action to that. Prove it. It's the same thing with faith. If you say you have faith, then you need to display your faith. There is an obedience that comes when you really have faith in God. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Every one of them guys, their faith was manifested by some type of action that they did. It's not that we have a works-based salvation in that sense, that if you do this, I'll do that. No, what it is, is that you, you can, by works-based, they mean that you can never be good enough for the love of God. Did you know that? You can never be good enough for His mercy, but He loves you just as He is, because God loves you in all of your mess. How many was a mess when you came to Jesus? Amen. How many a mess now?
Praise God. But God saved you in your mess, in spite of your mess. And so because of that, I love him, and I love the truth that he displays. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. It doesn't matter how far you've walked. The truth is, Jesus loves you, and he died for you, and that alone makes me want to live in love with him and have that girdle of truth about me. He said, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Again, it comes down to the word of God. Read your Bible. Let it get a hold of you. You want to grow in God? Read your Bible. Now, before you receive the Holy Ghost, you may have had a hard time understanding that Bible. How many did before you came to Jesus, before you got the Holy Ghost? The Bible was there. You could read it. You're just like words. But once you got the Holy Ghost, the Bible lets you know there are some things that are spiritually discerned. It begins to open up for you the truths hidden in that Word of God. Because now you have the Spirit of God resting upon you. Then he says that your feet are to be shod with the preparation, the preparation of the gospel of peace. Everywhere I walk do I bring peace. Am I prepared to bring peace in the people's lives? It is, it is a willingness not just to bring peace, but to be peaceful. Uh, when I leave a room, have I brought peace? Or are people in an uproar? You have to ask yourself the question then, am I really walking in peace? Isaiah 52, 7, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. Luke 1, 78, 78, Whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. We want that peace and that visitation. People want peace. He said, my peace I give to you. I give it to you. Uh, here it is. He's prepared to bring and put something in your life if you'll let him in your life. Luke 1 verse 79, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. There is a way of peace. And let me tell you something. The Bible says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. It's not easy to be a peacemaker. Uh, in business, they call them mediators. And what happens with a mediator is he stands between two opposing sides. And they're bickering back and forth one or trying to come to some kind of compromise. And it's not easy sometimes bringing forth peace in an unpeaceful situation. And who suffers at the end of the day? It's not the two parties. They both eventually get some kind of compromise worked out. But the guy in the middle that suffered the blows of their fury and their anger because they thought, well, he's taking their side or the other side thought they're taking his side. They're not being lenient enough or they're being too lenient. They're, they're not really working out. And so this peacemaker is having and suffering all kinds of blows. What about the prince of peace? Do you know what he suffered to bring peace to your life? Amen. He died on the cross at Calvary to bring peace to your life. He suffered being beat by a cat of nine tails to bring peace into our lives. And how can we do any less to bring peace into other people's lives? How, and how dare we get to the place in our walk with God where we become so full of strife and envying, perhaps, what the Peter thought, with wantonness and chamberness and all that stuff, that we have brought a lack of peace, perhaps, to the body of Christ. Remember where he brought you from. Remember the peace that he gave you and walk in that peace and try to continue to give that type of peace to those around you. Have you ever been in the presence of somebody who's just a peaceful person? That you can be with them and you just feel calm by being in their presence? I love those kinds of people because they love peace. What that tells me is they've spent time in prayer. They spent time in the Holy Ghost. They have spent time allowing God to change their will. They have said, Father, not my will, 
but thine be done. And he has done that in their life. People that are peaceful people, it's not because they've never been through stuff. They've been through things and they found out the only antidote for warfare is peace. It's true, it's a saying, but it's true. It says people fight, wars start, start when people stop talking. And then peace comes after war because they start talking again. Don't ever stop talking to God. Don't ever stop working in people's lives. Don't ever give up on the peace process. Because I'm tell, here to tell you tonight, we know the peace speaker. He speaks peace into every life. And so tonight, he's with us. That always present uh, Shema of God, always present with us. What is with us? His peace. He is the prince of peace. And it says, Romans 10, 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. We talk about the gospel. There is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is the gospel of the kingdom. Then there is the gospel of peace. We're ministering in the gospel of peace tonight. How many want peace? How many would raise your hand and say, you know, I'm going through a situation right now and I need peace? There's one, two, there's several. Let's just close our eyes right now and pray. Father, you're the God of peace. I pray right now, Jesus, that you would prepare us with our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Lord, I speak peace into each situation in this room, each home, God, each life, each heart. Lord, by your word, and by your power, begin to display that peace. Lord, where there is uproar, where there is discontent, Lord, where there is hurt, perhaps there's wounding God, there's confusion, I pray your peace overshadow those situations in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. How about praying the Holy Ghost right now? Hallelujah. When you call upon the Prince of Peace, you can see your situation changing. When you pray in the Holy Ghost, you're calling upon that Spirit to make intercession for you tonight. And God will begin to do the work in peace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Somebody said, in Jesus' name. The next is the shield of faith. The Bible says, by which we shall quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. There are things that come against you to attack your faith. Uh, the enemy will use every fiery dart he can. He'll use your loved ones. I love something that Brother Rowe taught me years ago. He said, you're just angels. You're just devil's food, he would say. Because of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the Lord cursed the serpent and said, you're going to go on your belly and you're going to eat the dust of the earth. Well, what we're made of is dust, right? So you are devil's food, you'd say. Uh, that's what the enemy works on. That's what he has to work with, is with your flesh. That's what he's working with every day. And if he can't get you through your flesh, guess what he's going to do? He's going to use somebody else's flesh to get to you, somebody you love, somebody you're close to. And so that's how the enemy operates, trying to get you to drop your shield of faith because he's fighting this battle against you. And so you have to ask the Lord, Lord, I, I got faith in this situation. I know you're going to keep me in it. See, the Lord, he is the author and the finisher of your faith. That means he knew from the beginning what the outcome was going to be. And so when you lose sight of that, you lose faith. But because God brought you through the battle, doesn't mean he's going to leave you in the middle of the battle to fall on your own and be gone. He's going to take you in the beginning of the battle, to the middle of the battle, and through to the other side. You just got to keep that, that shield of faith up there and don't let the enemy destroy it. Now what they did in the 
olden times, I'm told, in the Bible times, they would take these shields and sometimes they'd ru- they would rub oil on them because they would shoot fiery darts. And if you didn't have that on there, it was an oil that wouldn't burn. They'd wipe it right off and they wouldn't burn their wooden shoe- shields or sometimes they were wood with uh, brass on, the, on them or they would be made of skins of some type. They would make sure that they had some kind of fire retardant upon that shield. So what that's a type of is us praying in the Holy Ghost. Spend time in the Spirit. Spend time talking to God in prayer, and moving in prayer, speaking to Him, and letting His Spirit cover you. He shall cover thee, the Bible says, with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. It says in Isaiah 21, 5, prepare the table, which is, which, watch, I'm sorry, prepare the table, watch in the watchtower, eat, drink, arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield. How do you anoint the shield? By prayer. Every day, pray. Let that shield get anointed. Make sure you're walking and operating in the Holy Ghost because that's how we're supposed to operate. We're supposed to awaken out of sleep, put on the armor of light, and walk in the Spirit. How many have the Holy Ghost this, this evening? Then that means you're able to walk in the Spirit at all times. And so walk in the fervor of that spirit. Amen. And then it says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Uh, Men's wisdom will fail you every time. When somebody comes up to you and says, I think, be careful. But when they say, the Bible says, or I feel the Holy Ghost is leading me to tell you, You can pay attention to that as long as it matches up to the Word of God. Men's opinion, men's thoughts, men's thinking, they trust in the arm of the flesh. But we don't trust in the arm of the flesh. We trust in the arm of the Lord tonight. So keep that shield of faith. There are things coming against you that you've got to keep the shield of faith up. I know, I know the trials are hard. I know it's hard. How many have been betrayed by somebody before? Amen. It hurt. There's no hurt quite like that kind of hurt. You got that shield of faith. Lord, I don't understand why it went. I trusted them. They were like a, they were as close to me as anybody. How, how could that happen? Yet you got to keep that shield of faith up there because people will fail you. And then you have to have the courage to forgive. But you don't know why that betrayal took place. You don't know what they were facing, what they were struggling with. It's not, it doesn't matter. What matters is you fulfill the, the golden rule, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So if I had betrayed somebody, I would want them to forgive me, especially if I came repentant. Uh, but the, the greater ethic there is to, to forgive people whether they come to you or not. Have you ever done that? How do you know that you've forgiven them? It's when they walk in the room and you no longer think, well, that dirty, low life dog. <laughs> it doesn't cross your mind anymore. No, when they come in the room, it's, oh, it's so and so. I'm like, yeah, almost named names. Oh, it's so and so. My wife's got the big eyes, like, oh, who are you going to talk about? When you can grab a brother or a sister, that's wounded you and hugged them and have no animosity in your heart. That's when you've allowed all these accoutrements for battle to work properly. Your mind is right. Your heart's right. You're trusting in the truth. You've got the right shoes on. You want peace with everybody. And then you've got the shield of faith. And then... Paul says that we are supposed to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. For the Word of God is quick. It's alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of a joints and a marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of your heart. The Word of God slices through all that stuff. It slices through uh, the flesh and the bone. It gets to the, the real center of where you're living at. It discerns the thoughts 
and the intents of the heart. The Word of God doesn't just show you what you were thinking. That's the thoughts. But then it tells you why you thought what you thought in the first place. That's the intent. That's the part that I'm looking for in my life. I, I can see where the Word of God shows me what I did was wrong, but now I want to know why I did what I did in the first place. The Word of God will show that to you. The problem is, the Word of God is not just an offensive weapon for battle, but it can also be a surgical tool. Some people will take the, word of, will take the sword, the blade, they'll take that blade and they'll use it to kill. And there's a time for that. We're, we're fighting an enemy, right? But there's also a time to use the same blade to heal somebody. There's a way to cut somebody that heals them. There's a way to cut somebody that kills them. When we're dealing with each other, we don't want to kill one another. We don't want to wound people and destroy them. We want to help people. We want to see them healed. That's why the Bible says if you see somebody which is overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, a spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of meekness considering your own self. And you're supposed to go to that person and quietly and meekly and lovingly try to say, you know what, you need to change this. This is not the way it's supposed to be and, let, and deal with them as you would want to be dealt with yourself. That is the wound that cuts to heal. Uh, the, the Bible talks about that the faithful are the wounds of a friend. It doesn't mean, some people say it means that, that the, the, the worst wounds is the worm wound that comes from a friend. And there's some truth in that. When a person, the Bible says, I was wounded in the house of my friends. But there's also a deeper truth, which is that your friends, when they wound you, it's not because they want to hurt you. It's out of a sense of faithfulness to you. I had a friend, I still have a friend. He didn't have, I still have him. He lives in Indiana. He, uh, he went through a rough time in his first marriage and ended up in divorce. His wife and him uh, parted ways. He was getting to get remarried again. And um, a whole story about that. He named his son after me, poor kid. And at any rate, uh, he comes to me one day and says, Steve, he said, I'm getting ready to get married. He said, I, I want you to do something for me. you got to promise me you'll do this. I said, okay, I'll do whatever you ask. He said, if you ever see me acting the way I acted in my first marriage, come to me. Let me know about it. I said, are you sure... Are you sure you want me to do that? He said, yes, I do not want to make the same mistake twice. So he was married about three years. And then he started acting like a jerk. I watched him. I watched her. I watched the eyes. I, so I uh, got a card one day. I did it the coward's way. I got a card, blank card, wrote in there, you told me if blah, 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 and you're doing this and that, and you need to stop it if you want your marriage to... Survive. And then I was going out of town with uh, my pastor at the time, but the person he was preaching in Illinois, so he asked me to go with him. I said, Can we stop by so and so's house? He said, Sure. It was on the way out of town. I dropped it in the door and went on my way. He was mad. Now, I didn't have no cell phone, so this is before all that mess. And so he was madder than a hornet at me. He didn't talk to me for a whole month. He was so angry at me. But he changed. He took it to heart. His wife told me later, she said, I was so mad at you at first. And then I realized what you were trying to do. I was keeping my word to my friend because faithful are the wounds of a friend. I didn't do it to hurt him. I did it to love him. Now, this is what I'll tell you about that. Don't do that to somebody unless you're willing to have that done to you later on down the road. Okay? There, is a, uh, there is a thing called uh, sowing and reaping. So my friend today, they're still married. They have two children and doing wonderful. And maybe it was because of that moment where I said, okay, I'm going to do what he asked me. And so you have to decide when you're dealing with people, am I wounding to kill or am I wounding to heal? Now, when you're in battle with, the, with an enemy, the enemy of our souls, you're wounding to kill. Do not. You are on the offensive. You are going to take the kingdom. The Bible says that the violent taketh by force. Okay, the kingdom suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Do not. When you walk out of this church building tonight, this building that we come to worship in, you're going out on the streets of Huntington in your cars 
Wherever you're going to go for the next few days, you're going to be reminded, I hope, throughout the day that I've got on the armor of God today. And if I haven't taken the time, I'm going to pray it on. You pray on the helmet of salvation. Pray on the uh, breastplate of righteousness. Pray on the, uh, the loins girded about with truth. Go ahead and pray on that girdle. Go ahead and pray on your, that your, are sh- your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Go ahead and take on that shield of faith. Go ahead and pick up the sword of the Spirit. And pray those things every day. Am I walking the walk of peace? Am I holding up the shield of faith? Do I love the truth of God's Word? Am I allowing my heart to remain pure and unmolested and undestroyed? Do I have my breastplate of righteousness in operation? Am I keeping on the helmet of salvation and paying attention to what I'm listening to and how it's affecting me? If you do that, it makes you so that you can be strong in the battle and be battle ready. So the Bible says in Hebrews or Romans 13 and 4, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. We are revengers. We are doing something with this sword, attacking an enemy. Now turn to Psalm chapter 149, I believe it is, and I'm about to close. So everybody said amen. You didn't have to be so excited, Sister Star. Psalm chapter 149. Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. You want to know how to fight in battle? You first of all get your high praises going to God and you wield that sword. What is the sword? It is the Word of God. Again, we're going back to the Word of God. You want to attack and overcome the enemy? You need to know what the Word of God is. And so you begin to praise and magnify and worship God, and then you wield that sword, the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then the Bible says unto you that, Let the high praise of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword in their hands, to execute vengeance upon the heathen, and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains, and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute upon them the judgment written, This honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. Now, today, we're not fighting natural kings. We're not fighting natural kingdoms. We're fighting a spiritual battle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And how you overcome that is by putting on the armor of light, by putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, by putting on the armor of God, and then wielding that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and singing praises and worshiping God. If you do that, you're going to overcome. Because the Bible said right there that this honor have all his saints. You don't have to be defeated. You don't have to feel defeated. You don't have to wake up tomorrow thinking, I'm not going to make it through this day. I can't handle this battle. No, you can wake up knowing I'm going to put my armor on and I'm going to walk in faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in him. It doesn't matter how dark the day gets, how evil it gets, how wicked it gets. I am a child of God, and I have on his armor. So let's stand tonight. When we look at Ephesians, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. That's talking about he says, take on, take, take on the shield of faith, have the sword in your hand, and then pray always. So you're worshiping God, you're praising God, 
You're praying always with all prayer and supplication of spirit. And then he says to stay alert. Be perseverant. Don't lose sight of what's going on around you. This is not the time to go to sleep. He said, awaken out of sleep. Get out of bed and then be persistent in your prayers. And he says, do it for all saints. So look at your brother tonight and let him know, or your sister, I'm praying for you. Because he said, pray, for, you got the armor on. That means if I've got my armor on and you've got your armor on, when I'm praying for you, I am protecting you. Another way that we say it, where I come from, is I got your back, brother. I got your back. Doesn't matter what's going on around me, I got your back. I'm going to protect you. So I'm praying for my brothers. And then it says, pray for your leader. Paul said, pray for me, that I may act with boldness. And so we got the armor on. We're well prepared for battle. And this is the time right now, <coughs> especially with what's going on with our bishop, that we need to pray for him, that God would strengthen him and encourage him and keep him. Because this is what we're doing with this armor. We're prepared for battle. We're prepared to win. How many want to win? Amen. I'm in it to win it. Not to lose it. Praise God. If that's how you feel tonight, make your way to the front. We're going to pray as we sing a song. <clears throat> My will to break. That's what. I'll be willing to do whatever it takes to be more like you, Lord. That's what I'll be willing to do. Whatever it takes for my will to break, that's what I'll be willing to do. Hallelujah. Just close your eyes and raise your hands. I'll trade sunshine for rain, comfort. For pain, that's what I'll be willing to do. Whatever it takes for my will to break, that's what I'll be willing. So let's pray right now. Pray the armor on yourself right now. Father, I take on this, this helmet of salvation right now, Jesus. Protect my mind, God. I know the battle was raging. The battlefield is in my mind, God. So I'm taking this helmet of salvation right now, Lord. I ask you to be with me. Protect my thinking, God. Protect what I myself and what's around me. That I would learn, God, to pay attention to the Spirit my eyes in the spirit my spiritual senses God to be alive my hearing Lord the smelling Jesus help me to know the difference in Jesus name Lord I take on the breastplate of righteousness right now Jesus protect my heart protect my emotions God don't let a root of bitterness get in me Jesus some wound that started out small but grew God instead I pray you'd pull out it that bitterness by the root, God, help me to forgive, to love as you love, God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, help me to take on this girdle, God of truth. Oh, Lord, I love your truth. I love your word, Jesus. Help me to apply it in my life, to always, always submit to your word, Jesus. In your precious name, God. Lord, I take on the sheet, the feet. Shaw with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Lord, help me to walk in peace in my own life, God, and those around me, Jesus. Help me to be a peacemaker, Jesus. No matter how hard it might be that I would be there to dis disseminate this gospel of peace to those who are hurting and wounded, God, and they don't have peace in their lives. Help 
me to be that peace speaker like you have been for me, Jesus. Lord, I take on the shield of faith tonight, quenching every fiery dart of the enemy. And my faith in you, Jesus, will cause me to be able to overcome every attack, no matter how great, how strong, no matter how wicked the enemies are, how strong the barrage, God, will be protected by that faith that you've given us. And we take the sword of the Spirit. We praise your mighty name. And we worship you, God. We wield your word, Jesus. And we thank you and give you glory for it, God, in Jesus' name. And now, Lord, I walk. I walk, God, in this armor. Every day, Jesus, I've got myself out of bed. I've awakened out of sleep. I'm ready for the enemy's attack, Jesus. In fact, I'm not even waiting no more, God. I'm going on the attack. I'm going to go in those highways and byways. I'm not going to let Jesus, that place called hell, grow because of my lack of responsibility, Jesus. But I'm going in there right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many know you can take the city? We can take the city of Huntington. One way we do that is by making sure we're dressed correctly with the armor of God. Every day, pray, Lord, help me to put on the armor of God today. Every day, walk in that, wielding that sword of the Spirit, holding up that shield of faith, praising God, praying to God, and then also allowing yourself the luxury of knowing that Jesus is with you. He's with you every day.